Okay, so uh, good evening, everyone. You're all very welcome to this evening's uh, Microsoft Teams live broadcast. And as I say, we have a, a very large attendance in so far. It's at two and a half thousand attendees um, and climbing all the time. Um, so we'll just give a brief overview before we begin. Uh, my name is Owen Tuhi. I am the Officer Development Coordinator uh, with the GA in Crow Park. Um, and we have, uh, I am part of the COVID uh, education team who have put this uh, webinar session together. We'll start with a, wishing you and your families all the best. Hope you're all doing very well. Um, and we're all looking forward very much to getting back on the field of play and the resumption of Gaelic Games activities. Um, the purpose of this session on a, at a broad level in conjunction with uh, the online modules and the online resources that we've put together is to do so in as safe a manner as we can. And this, uh, the educational package that we put together has been a combined effort with the GEA, the LGFA and the Camogie Association. I suppose the key aim of this evening's session um, is to provide uh, chiefly the COVID supervisors, uh, club officers, um, players, team personnel, parents and guardians of underage players uh, with key information uh, on their roles and responsibilities during, um, as we resume uh, re return to action. While it is aimed at these roles, um, as outlined, any club member or volunteer um, will benefit from, from the knowledge that they will gain from both this session and the online sessions that we have uh, prepared, the online modules and the online resources that are available now on learning.ga.ie. So before we begin, I would like to uh, welcome our presenters this evening. Uh, Fergal McGill uh, is the, um, the director of the GA Player Club and Games Administration. And Shay Bannon is the chair of the COVID-19 advisory group. Uh, we were due to be joined by Dr. Kevin Moran, who is the Donegal GA team doctor and a member of the GA Medical, Scientific and Welfare Committee. Uh, unfortunately, uh, due to uh, unforeseen circumstances, Kevin is not available uh, to attend this evening. However, we have been in close contact with uh, Dr. Kevin um, and any specific medical queries that have been asked in advance of this session uh, will be dealt with at a, at a later stage. So just before I pass you over, um, just a few small housekeeping bits as you can see here. Microphones are automatically muted, and this is a live broadcast given uh, the volume of people we were dealing with. Um, we had uh, a good response to our, our form that was sent out in advance for registration. Uh, questions have been submitted and reviewed there, and we're dealing with as many as we can uh, at the end of the presentation uh, across broad themes. Um, a further feedback form would have been emailed to people who registered today. Uh, with the opportunity to leave feedback on tonight's session and also to submit one additional question uh, at the end of this workshop. And the idea would be that in a few days time, we will collate responses to those as best we can um, and provide guidance to, uh, to volunteers. In addition to that, I suppose uh, this is a three pronged approach. As I say, the webinar is only a part of that and we would hope to have uh, further webinars in a series. Uh, based on demand as, as time goes on. As, as, as everyone knows, it's an ever evolving situation and we have to be agile in our approach to it. There is an e-learning module um, which is uh, to be developed in the later stage of development now and it will be launched uh, later this week. The idea behind that is that it will be completed by uh, just about anyone who is going inside the grounds of uh, a Gaelic Games field to so ensure that everyone is up to speed with the protocols uh, involved. We're also ensuring that the GA Learning website uh, is going to become the central hub for all information resources available uh, to, as I say, just about anyone uh, who is intending to get resume uh, Gaelic Games activities of any sort. So that's just about all of the uh, bits covered there now, I think. Um, as I say, the Q&A is disabled for this session, uh, given the large numbers that we're dealing with. Uh, but there are plenty of questions at the end of the presentation, which, which the lads will deal with, uh, which cover uh, a broad range of, of topics. Uh, we know there's a lot of questions at this time, and we will continue to do our best uh, where possible to collate those in, over broad themes and to uh, answer people's queries and put people's minds at ease. So without further ado, I will pass you over now to Mr. Shea Bannon uh, to begin the session. Oh, 
Oh, I'm just waiting for the slides to come up. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, delighted to join you this evening on this webinar. Um, start by briefly maybe providing some background on information as to how we've arrived at this point on the roadmap, and maybe also to clarify some issues before we begin to go through the actual presentation. Um, the COVID advisory group held its first meeting on Monday the 11th of May last, and has continued to meet every week since then. Uh, I think it's important that as chairperson, I, I acknowledge the work of the advisory committee to date and the fact that the knowledge and expertise of the members has been essential in moving things forward and ensuring that the association delivers for members in line with best and emerging practice. I similarly would like to give huge credit has to be given to the staff in Crow Park, who are undertaking so much of the heavy lifting in terms of implementing and preparing guidance around the suggested pro uh, protocols. Uh, the COVID advisory group was tasked with preparing a guidance document and recommendations that would inform the safe resumption of activities within the Gaelic Games family. Uh, the evidence and research to date indicates that the resumption of activities is a complex process, that it may not be linear, and that small and deliberate steps must be taken before there can be a return to full activity. As a result, the roadmap prepared by the advisory group outlines and defines a set of recommended minimum practice for the reintroduction of activities within our clubs. The objective is to advise club members and clubs on how a resumption of activities can be best achieved in a controlled and safe manner. And obviously the primary aim is to protect the health and safety of players, coaching and backroom staff as a return to playing Gaelic games and to minimise the risk of transmission within the wider community. It is also important to acknowledge and recognise any recommended protocols and procedures must fit the unique status of Cumann Lua Class Gael and they must be capable of being applied and aligned equally across all the units of the association. We are a 32 county organisation. This may present some challenges for the rollout of the roadmap, particularly when the phase and guidance for the reopening of society and business is not aligned in both jurisdictions. The status of the current COVID-19 pandemic is ever changing and evolving, with the result that the resumption of activities and the timing of progression between the various phases outlined may be influenced by factors which are outside the control of the association, as happened on the 5th of June when the Irish government reduced the number of phases from five to four. Similarly, um, the resolution of some important issues and questions in terms of solutions and procedures rests outside the remit of the advisory group and indeed the association itself. Some queries that we do not have yet have answers for and are awaiting guidance from the appropriate bodies or agencies. I'd just like to reassure you all that when necessary information and guidance is provided, it will be shared with you immediately. Uh, I want to make it very clear that the guidelines, protocols and recommendations within the guidance document are capable of evolving and staying abreast of changes in government policy and developments within our own association. You would already have seen some changes to the document that was launched on the 5th of June last. Finally, this roadmap is a living document, so it is likely that there may be additional changes and amendments to it as the pace quickens over the coming weeks. Rest assured that the advisory group will adopt a flexible approach in order to accommodate and to respond to changes in government measures, medical guidance, and to the evolving developments within the association. Now, turn to the aims of this evening's webinar. So the aim is first of all to communi communicate the safe return guidelines, to explain the key roles and responsibilities within each club, and to hopefully address some common questions that have been presented to us at the end of it. Um, the webinar this evening does not um, want to replace what is contained in the latest safe return guidelines. It cannot cover every question that is submitted. Uh, policies on frequently asked questions will be issued in the coming days and more specific webinars will be covered in due course on such areas, games development, um, staff, referees, etc. And again, I think it's very important to point out that should any conflict arise between information given in this webinar and the text of the latest uh, safe return guidelines, the text of the guidelines shall prevail. The areas we're going to cover with you this evening um, are medical information, preparing for a safe return, basic information for players and team personnel, safe return responsibilities and checklist, the safe return roadmap, and then the common questions. 
I now hand over to Fergal who will take on the presentation from here. Fergal, we just ask you to on mute there, sorry. I had, a, I had a lovely speech there that, that you all missed, unfortunately, but there you go. Uh, listen, thank you all very much for logging on tonight. It's it's great to see such numbers and such interest in uh, what we're trying to do and in the safe return that we're trying to put in place. Um, I suppose just as a, as a, a comment at the start, uh, what we're trying to do here is minimise risk for, for people in clubs. We can't eliminate risk, no more than the government can eliminate risk in society gener generally. While, while COVID is in place, there, there is going to be some level of risk. So I think what you're about to hear, you, you need to think about it in that context, that everything we're doing is trying to minimise risk. So the guidelines document, uh, hopefully you've all read it at this stage, um, it begins with an introduction and, 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 and the context of the document. And I suppose it's important to point out that the document is relevant to the island of Ireland. Uh, we may have some people on the call from overseas. Unfortunately, we weren't able to interpret all of the, the local laws that exist overseas. Uh, it also flags the need for further information. Uh, we're not saying that this is uh, the beginning and the end of the advice that we provide. Um, it is an evolving situation, it's a fluid situation, and we'll, we'll react as the government gives us more information. Um, the document is based on the best advice available. We had a number of medics uh, on the committee who, who played a, a very important role, uh, including Dr Mary Horgan, who's a, a, an expert on epidemiology. So it, it's, it, it's based, as I say, on best available advice. Um, and hopefully that, that adds to the sense of, of safety you'll all feel around it. Uh, it does follow the government roadmap, as Shea pointed out. Uh, it defines minimum practices for the resumption of our activities and it acknowledges that the timelines may change due to external factors. And the main timeline uh, that you'll all be aware of is that the government are due to move on to phase three of, of their plan on June 29th. Uh, and that's a key date for us all. And some of you might be wondering why the GA are waiting until June 29th to um, open our facilities. Well, there's two reasons, because you people on the ground uh, need time to prepare um, for that. But also uh, we felt it was prudent to wait to see, will the government move on to phase three? Because as you all know, there's no guarantees uh, in that uh, scenario. So finally, the, 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 we stress throughout the document that participation is on an opt-in, opt-out basis. If individuals or indeed entire clubs feel that this isn't for them, that's 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 fine. Um, you know, we have to respect people's personal opinions, and already we have heard from from clubs um, about individual players who, who who may have certain circumstances that just prevent them from, as they would see it, taking the risk uh, to participate. So it's important to to just make that point. So the first section in the document is the medical information and it's split into two parts. Uh, the first part is basic information for clubs. It's probably stuff you're all very, very familiar with at this stage over the last 12 or 14 weeks. Uh, we're pretty much all well versed in the best practice habits for staying safe or for how the vi virus is transmitted, the symptoms uh, of the virus, etc. So you probably know most of that information from, from watching television, if nothing else. Uh, but nonetheless, we, we, we broke it down into some very, very basic guidelines for clubs. There is more detailed medical information if you wish to look it up. It's hyperlinked from the main document um, and you can you can just click on that when you're reading the document. So section two uh, talks about preparing for a safe return and we, we, we look at a high level, I suppose, at preparing our facilities. We introduced the concept of COVID supervisors and I know a huge number of you on the webinar tonight are very interested in COVID supervisors, uh, what they are and obviously the need for COVID supervisors to complete the e-learning module, which as Owen mentioned, uh, we will certainly have in the next uh, 48 hours, I would have thought available. Uh, it also speaks to the importance of scheduling your activities uh, in clubs making sure you have a good timetable so that people know uh, exactly what team are using your facilities at what time and on what day. Uh, and it stresses the importance of educating club members um, and it, it gives you some advice on, on how you can best do that. The third section in the document is information for players and team personnel. 
Um, it talks about the completion of the e-learning module and how important that is for both players and, and uh, backroom people, be it managers or coaches or whatever. Uh, it gives information on the health questionnaire and what is required around that. It outlines hygiene best practice, uh, the importance to adhering to social distancing in phase three. So just a reminder again, in phase three on June 29th, um, our activities will be performed with social distancing in mind. So uh, whether it's your ball drills or, or whatever else, they need to be designed to ensure people are, where possible, remaining two metres apart. There's no contact in phase three. In phase four, there is contact. It's our normal training, our normal uh, games as we've known them all our lives um, but there are some helpful hints on how you can reduce contact to a minimum and that's that's really simple stuff uh, you know such as uh, doing away with handshakes or high fives or, or whatever it's simple stuff but it can all help and it does all reduce risk uh, there's no access to our changing rooms in either phase three or phase four uh, an interesting uh, stat that that our our medics have given us is that you're 19 times more likely to contract coronavirus uh, indoors than you are outdoors. So outdoors brings down the risk level hugely. So 19 times, uh, I'll repeat that, more, more likely to uh, contract uh, coronavirus indoors. We also talked about travel to and from training, and that's really just following the government advice that's in place, which is that people from the same household should travel together in cars. But if you're from a separate household and you want to reduce risk, then we advise that you don't travel in the same car to, to trainings. We're, we're also uh, not allowing indoor meetings in, in either phase three or phase four. And again, I'll repeat it again, you're 19 times more likely uh, to contract the virus indoors than outdoors. And that's that's simply the thinking behind uh, why we've we, we've done away with indoor meetings uh, in section in phase three and phase four. So just to focus on the health questionnaire then for a second, uh, because I know that's a, a huge issue for people at the moment and they're trying to get their heads around it. Uh, the health questionnaire can complete it online or it can be done in hard copy. Uh, if it's done in hard copy, it should be presented to the relevant COVID supervisor on entry to the facility. We would recommend that it be uh, completed online if possible, but we know that's not possible in, in all circumstances. So you only fill out the health questionnaire once at the beginning, but then each individual will be required to sign a declaration at each subsequent session just to confirm that their health status has not changed. So you fill out the uh, health questionnaire once and then you confirm at subsequent sessions that your health status has not changed. So an online system, as I mentioned, for the health questionnaire uh, will be provided centrally. Um, and this is the only online system that, that should be used. Um, so full details in relation to that online solution as well will be circulated uh, next week. So I think here we have a, the, as I say, this is in production. It's the online uh, version of the health questionnaire. And we have a short video on this, which we'll play, which I think will be useful to you all. The following video shows the process required to fill in and submit an electronic version of the health questionnaire required to be completed by all participants in Gaelic games in advance of returning to their clubs. It also shows the simple process that allows COVID supervisors to validate that the forms have been completed and that the players on their teams are cleared to participate. The health questionnaire contains a number of yes no questions that must be submitted before a player's first return to their club. Subsequent participation must also be preceded by confirmation from the player that their status has not changed. Guardians may complete the form on behalf of their children. The form itself will be available on the homepage of the GAA website, ga.ie, or by typing the link returntoplay.ga.ie into your browser. So screen one here is our registration screen, and we're going to log in and, and register with a user called John Murphy. So we'll fill out the re relevant information on this first registration screen. The user must confirm that they are at least 18 years old and that they have read the data protection notice. On the second screen, we gather some more relevant information about this user, including their address and what club they're associated with. It's worth pointing out that you can add multiple clubs here. You'll also be asked to pre-check a couple of information checkboxes regarding the COVID-19 return to play awareness course and whether or not you're a COVID-19 supervisor. When I click continue, I'll be taken into the dashboard of the app. 
And a couple of things to note here. The first thing is I can see my health and safety data protection notice, and I can close that if I want to, but it will be open by default. And I can see here that I have no health questionnaires currently added. So what I'm gonna do now is show you how to add a new one. I'll click add new, and I'll be taken to my add new health questionnaire form. Uh, here I'm greeted with a series of questions related to who I am and anything then related to COVID-19 symptoms. So a series of yes, no questions that I have to answer. And down below here, I have just some information relating to those questions and a checkbox to say that I understand and confirm what I've just filled out and signed and I will submit that. So now we can see that as John Murphy, I submitted my first health questionnaire. So I can filter um, these records if I have more than one, that's a useful feature to have. And I can see the most recent one here at the top. Now, what I'm gonna show is that I can also reconfirm this. So each time I need to confirm my COVID form again, I don't need to add new, I can just reconfirm it here. So if I click reconfirm this, I'll get a pop-up saying, you sure you want to confirm this? And I'll submit it, hit confirm. And if I close that then I can see that that new record has just been added. Next, I'm going to show what a COVID-19 supervisor will see when they are logged into the app and they're starting to see declarations come in. So I'm going to switch user here to a different person. This person is seeing quite a lot of information coming in here. Um, the filter is pre-checked to show everything and show only under 14s from a certain club. So that's useful when there's a lot of uh, teams and clubs and you want to filter down that information. They can also see records that they have submitted and records that have been submitted by parents of the children that are involved in this team. Uh I suppose the important message around that in any case is that we will have an online solution. It's almost finished and it'll be it'll be rolled out to you all. It's a very simple, very easy to use uh, solution uh, that'll be rolled out to you all. As I said, there's there's no obligation on people to use um, the online version, but we would encourage it because there, there are advantages to it, particularly in the areas of, of GDPR and in terms of keeping records of who was at training for uh, contact tracing down the road. So section four of the uh, document is the club summary and checklist and we've decided to reproduce it here on the slides for you just so you get a full picture of what needs to be done in order to return to play. So the first thing that you should do is circulate the latest safe return guidelines. They're, they're the ones that were circulated on Friday last uh, and you should send that to all COVID supervisors, all your club officers, players, team personnel and parents and guardians, basically anyone who'll be, who'll be coming to your facilities. Um, the second thing you need to do is ensure that all attendees at training sessions or games have completed the e-learning module. Uh, the third team is to ensure that each, te each team has a nominated COVID supervisor. Uh, then you should prepare your club facilities in line with the recommendations in section two of the guidelines. They're very basic uh, recommendations. What they talk about is making sure you have a few signs in place, uh, making sure that um, there's hand sanitizer available and just making sure that you sanitize um, exposed areas of the facilities such as door handles, um, the toilets if, if it was used etc after each session. It's, it's basic stuff, it's stuff you're probably all doing at home uh, every single day now anyway. Uh, then you need to establish and communicate a timetable system and listen, uh, the vast majority of clubs will have that in place anyway, uh, given the number of teams that are probably using your, your facilities. Uh, but it's just a little reminder of the importance of that timetabling. Um, you should always also establish and communicate a process for the health questionnaire, which we've which we've talked about. Um, again, it's it's straightforward enough stuff. It's just making sure that that you have it covered off, that everyone knows how it's being done. So section five then of the document is essentially the, the safe return roadmap. As we mentioned already, it's consistent with the government return roadmap. 
and we're, we're, we're giving it to you with a warning that, that each, each phase for us is subject to the government moving on to their next phase. So you need to be conscious that any delay in the government moving to phase three or phase four will mean we have to delay and stay in our phase, whatever phase that happens to be at the time. So phase two is the one obviously that we're currently in. It began on the 8th of June. The only GA facilities that should be open at the moment are our walkways, pitches uh, remain closed, our club buildings uh, remain closed. Individual training in line with government recommendations, that, that's a matter for the individuals if they're doing that in public parks or on walkways uh, around the country or, or wherever they happen to be doing it. But that's that's uh, shouldn't really be organised by the club, I guess. It's, it, it's a matter for individuals if they are training uh, at that time. And during this period, as I mentioned, uh, the e-learning module is being developed and, and will be rolled out in the next couple of days. Phase three then uh, begins, hopefully, fingers crossed, on the 29th of June. And what we envisage is that pitches will be open for small group training uh, for adults and juveniles. But all buildings should remain closed. And the exception to that is, is, is the toilet, obviously, when, when training is going on. And the toilet will, will need to be sanitised, as, as, as we mentioned, before and after training. Uh, all training should be non-contact in this phase. Uh, we're recommending that only small groups, 10 players and two coaches in a dedicated area of the field should participate. Uh, I know the government have, have moved to 15 players. Uh, however, as Shay mentioned at the start, we are a 32 county organisation and it's only the southern government who have moved to that. The government in the six counties haven't moved to that yet. So we're leaving at 10 players for the moment. Um, if if that changes in the north, then that's fine. Uh, we'll communicate that to you. If we're if we're able to deliver fifteen players in in, in both jurisdictions, that's fine. We'll communicate that to you. Uh, players should arrive in the park togged out, and the principle of get in, train, and get out uh, will apply right throughout. Uh, the next couple of months. Uh, you know, clubs are are great social places for gathering, as we all know. Um, but the sacrifice we're asking you to make is that people get in train and get out, don't hang around. So the health questionnaire must be completed, as I mentioned, has to be completed once, um, and then uh, you, you, you can sign afterwards uh, at subsequent sessions uh, to say that your health circumstances haven't changed. There has to be a COVID supervisor in place for each team, which we've mentioned. Underage players must be dropped off and collected, and I think it's important for you all that are involved with clubs that uh, parents understand that they shouldn't leave until the child has been admitted uh, to the ground itself. Uh, in phase three, we're recommending that only players and management are permitted entry to the grounds. Um, and that's just again to try and reduce risk. Uh, I know it's a sacrifice for some people who like to come down and watch training or whatever, but uh, if we want to reduce risk, we, we have to make this point. So the type of training which we'd envisage taking place is running, aerobic training, agility training, uh, or ball work, but, but social distancing should be in place in, in, in this phase. And then there should be no sharing of equipment. So for example, water bottles um, or bibs or whatever, we should try and avoid that if we can. Again, that'll help us to minimise risk. And look at, you might want to look at making sure your players know to bring their own water to training um, and, and perhaps to, to label their bottles so that they know it is their own water that they're drinking from. So phase four uh, will we'll begin on the 20th of July. That'll see a return to contact training. Uh, between the, 10, the, the the 20th of July and the 31st of July, you know, we're advising that that, that be used to get people back up to speed in terms of contact from a welfare uh, perspective. However, if clubs want to run uh, challenge games uh, in those 11 days, in that 11 day period, then that is permitted. But we've asked counties not to schedule games until Friday the 31st of July at the earliest. Buildings will remain closed so that, that, that still players will need to turn up uh, togged out and ready to go. The health questionnaire, the COVID supervisor, the collation of data, that should all still be in place. And uh, in terms of whether people can come and watch our games, we actually don't know at this stage. Uh, the government have said in their return to play roadmap uh, that they envisage spectators, but only where they can be, um, where, where they can social distance. Uh, and they've talked about limited numbers. They will provide folks uh, further information to us nearer to the time. And as soon as we have it, we'll give that on to you. But I know that's an area of concern for people. Will spectators be allowed to, to attend our games? I suspect they will, uh, but we haven't 
received guidance on that from the government yet, but they will provide that for us in due course. So phase five then, uh, as I say, our document was intended to mirror the government document. We decided to leave in our phase five because it does mark another um, escalation, if you like, in, in our activity. So club games will continue throughout this period. Uh, access to our facilities will be permitted then, so to our dressing rooms, etc. from then on. Um, and we'll put in place and, and give it to you in plenty of time, recommendations on how dressing rooms, etc. should be sanitised. County training uh, won't resume until the 14th of September and, and that goes for under 20s, minors, uh, seniors. Um, the inter-county schedule then will start no earlier than the 17th of October and the CCC will produce a full fixture schedule once we know we're moving on to phase three. We felt it would be uh, imprudent uh, to do so ahead of knowing where, where we're going because if there is uh, a pause um, ahead of uh, phase three, um, it, it, it really throws everything up in the air for us in terms of uh, fixture scheduling, etc. So I'll hand you back to Owen for a second uh, for the, the, the questions that have been submitted. Thanks, Orgel. Uh, I believe the first set here are applicable to yourself. Oh, very good. Um, and just, just in relation to the, the COVID officer slash COVID supervisor and the, the wording behind yeah. that. Yeah, I'll keep going. So, um, look, uh, the, the questions you've submitted, we've we've tried to edit them as best we can so that so that they cover generalities. So our apologies that, that obviously we couldn't look at four or five thousand specific questions. So we've we've grouped them. Um, so there is no COVID officer as such. Uh, but what we have are COVID supervisors. So each team should have a supervisor, as we mentioned, and, and uh, people have asked, you know, how many super COVID supervisors do we need? You need someone allocated to each team to, 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 to just monitor. Um, and as we said, the club executive should communicate the details of who the COVID supervisor is for each team, uh, basically to everyone involved. And they should ensure that the appointed person receives all the necessary support to undertake the role. And really, you know, the necessary support, what we mean in that context, is just making sure that they're given the, the various information that we'll be pushing out to club secretaries uh, in, in the coming weeks. And we might just ask uh, Shea to come in here if he can. Yeah, um, again, the question of thermometers was in the original documentation. And again, it's very important to stress that um, clubs should not invest in thermometers. The revised guidelines, which were issued on the 12th of June, removed any requirement for clubs to check temperatures on site. Um, I suppose the onus is now on the individual or a parent or guardian of underage players to make sure that, this, that they actually are available and fit to play games. Um, and I suppose the whole notion of personal responsibility is central to the success of what we're actually proposing. So again, just to make sure that you're aware that the purchase of thermometers is not needed. Again, um, our hand gel dispensers needed if antibacterial soap and water is provided. And again, the recommendation, and again, this is come from the National Health and Safety Committee, is that it's strongly re recommended that hand sanitizers will be provided in car parks, toilets, and entrance to pitch and pitch side. Again, hand washing facilities and antibacterial soap will suffice. And uh, <laughs> Again, I think it's me answering this question as well. Will clubs receive guidance for purchasing things like signage, sanitizer, and PPE? And again, you'll see that there's a, a link on the GA site um, on the procurement of COVID-19 equipment and supplies uh, that might be required to mitigate against the risk for clubs. Uh, the categories include face coverings, hand sanitizers, dispensers, and hand wash stations, antibacterial disinfectant, and signage. And again, all guidance that is provided is based on current government guidelines, and that's subject to change as well. So I think we're we're back to me here, and uh, there's been some confusion around the ratios for adult to child uh, supervision. So you'll know that we've we've mentioned in the document that it should be uh, that we're permitting groups of ten players uh, and, and and two coaches uh, in a designated area of the field. But the code of behaviour for underage contains strict child safeguarding adult to child ratios, uh, and they're actually enshrined in our rules. So. What, what they are is that, just in case you don't know this, but I'm sure you've been practicing this <clears throat> all year and for the last for the last while anyway, uh, you should have one coach 
for, for every eight children under the age of 12 years old, plus one other adult present. And there should be one coach uh, for every 10 children over the age of 12, uh, also with another adult present. So the one other adult may be a coach, uh, or it can be a supervisor, an on-coaching person, uh, and, and they may, for convenience purposes, act in that capacity for more than one team at a time. So I hope I hope that's clear. Um, if you want to go on there, on to the second part of that question. So the guidelines uh, reference reduced numbers of training with maximum of 10 permitted in a group. Uh, but when working with children and young people, the ratios in the code of behaviour must be adhered to. So they do take precedence over what's in the document. It's, it's it, when, when we're referring to underage uh, teams and children. And then clubs are reminded for girls are participated, participating in training or for girls only training, a minimum of one female liaison officer is required to be present for the duration of the training session. And as I say, that's that's coming from the code of behaviour. Uh, so that's coming from, from government regulations in, in a different context, a separate context context obviously to COVID. And again, um, this question has got to do with children leaving their backpacks in club, uh, in club dressing rooms prior to the 10th of August. And again, the guidance is very clear. Backpacks must be left in stands or dugouts which are supervised. We do not want people going into buildings, so it's very clear. So uh, the health questionnaire again, and who must complete the health questionnaire? When must it be completed and how often must it be completed? So <clears throat> again, just to re-emphasize, the health questionnaire must be completed by COVID supervisors and club officers, players, parents and guardians of underage players, all team personnel, uh, referees, which we'll, we, we'll deal with uh, ourselves in the counties, uh, and anyone else <clears throat> present uh, who's involved in a training session or game. Yeah, on, on the field that is of course. So the questionnaire will need to be completed once before the initial return to training. So everyone needs to do it once. It's only five or six questions. It's very straightforward and basic. I'm sure you've seen it in the in the revised document. Um, and then each individual will be required to sign a declaration at subsequent sessions to confirm their health status has not changed. So uh, that can be, we, we will provide a template for that as well. So that, that can be as simple as just signing your name on the way in, uh, or the COVID supervisor making sure uh, that, that every participant in the training session is signing and saying, my health uh, status hasn't changed since I filled out the questionnaire initially. In terms of how uh, personal information will be stored, uh, the online system, which we were hoping to show you earlier on, uh, a sample of, but there will be an online system provided to allow clubs to process personal data in compliance with, with data protection legislation. So obviously GDPR <coughs> legislation is, is a reality uh, that's with us now in the more than COVID. So uh, we have to make sure you're all safe in that context as well. And that's why one of the main reasons for the online system. So it's it's essential to follow the process to ensure the security of data, especially where health data is concerned. And as we say, training will be provided to, to COVID supervisors on this in due course and, 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 and templates rolled out to you. Okay, the next question has got to do with contact tracing. And uh, again, contact tracing identifies people who are in close contact with someone who has COVID-19 uh, and the protocol for contact tracing will be as per the HSE guidelines and again if you want to look those up they're available on the website and it's, you have it there in front of you so again it's important to look those up and to be familiar with them. So just uh, just before I move on to this question I might just say a, a quick word on contact tracing because a lot of people have asked uh, the question in the last couple of days of us in terms of uh, close contacts and, and and what will constitute close contact and what's happen what happens if someone in a training session uh, turns out to be COVID positive what are the implications for the club we are waiting for government advice on that uh, however a uh, one of the things that's very important to point out to you is uh, there are close contacts and there are casual contacts. So close contacts, in, and I'm talking in the, the general health sense, a close contact, uh, if you are a close contact of someone who has got COVID, you have to uh, self-isolate for 14 days. However, if you're, if you're a casual contact, uh, you're merely asked to monitor your own health for the following 14 days. You do not have to um, you do not have to self-isolate. The likelihood is, 
And as I say, we're awaiting this from government, we're awaiting clarification, but the likelihood is that in the sporting context, outdoors, uh, people you've been training with will be considered casual contacts as opposed to close contacts. So it's an important distinction. And as I say, we will give you that information when we have it, but I think it's worth pointing out the difference between a close contact and a casual contact. We do think it's likely people will be considered casual contacts in a sporting uh, context and it's um, they wouldn't have to self-isolate, but that's that's just by the way. So who will monitor completion of the e-learning module? Look, the onus is on clubs to ensure that anyone entering their facilities have completed the e-learning module. Um, and those who complete the module, will they be able to take a, a, a print shot, they'll be able to print their certificate of completion at the end of the module, or they can download it, or they can take a screenshot of their certificate of completion. But it's also, again, just to remind you that this is this is all being done on a best endeavours basis. You know, we're asking people to follow this advice and guidelines. Uh, we won't be lining uh, anyone up or throwing them out of the association if they haven't completed the e-learning module. But we would hope, no more than in society generally, that people will react well to this and do what we're asking them to do. It's a simple thing to ask them to do. How can we train, play and maintain physical distancing? Well, look, our games development department are preparing content for coaches around phase three, and that'll be that'll be rolled out. Um, I, I mentioned some of the activities we'll be able to do in phase three in terms of ball work, etc. Uh, you know, we can still be doing our, our soloing drills, our uh, kicking drills, catching drills, etc. Uh, as long as as long as we're, we're we're socially distant, and then phase four will be full contact in accordance with the government roadmap. Uh, but we will be emphasising in phase four the importance of maintaining social distancing off the field. And then how many teams can a player train with? How many can a mentor coach? So this is a question that has come up uh, quite regularly over the last seven or ten days. Uh, players can train with multiple teams within the club if they wish. There is no problem with that. Some people, I suppose, read the document and were unclear on that, but we don't have a problem with players training on multiple teams. And, and likewise, there's no restriction on the amount of teams within the club that, uh, that, that a coach can be involved with. Uh, can multiple groups train on the same pitch at the same time? Again, a question that has come up uh, an awful lot. And, and yes, they can. Multiple groups can uh, train on the pitch at the same time. Uh, but that, that's only relevant to phase three. It's important to point that out. By the time we go into phase four, uh, that stipulation will be gone. Uh, and, and the advice we're given with multiple groups, we're not telling you it should be three groups or five groups or 10 groups. You've all got different facilities uh, available to you. It would be very difficult for us to, to um, start telling you all uh, specifics that might not suit you. So what we would say to you is just ensure you're satisfied that there's a sufficient space to accommodate social distancing with the groups uh, that are involved. Now, Dr. Kevin isn't with us, so I'll, I'll keep going on this. Um, he, he, he provided us answers on this one in terms of how much contact can players have with equipment such as footballs and slitters. So the advisory group uh, is satisfied that the risk of transmission via equipment and in particular footballs and slitters is low. It's a very, very low risk. I think it's very important to emphasise that point. Um, but footballs, slitters and cones, if you're providing them, as I'm sure you will be, they, they should be sanitised. Again, it's about minimising risk. Even though the risk is low, let's try and make it even lower. Um, and as a best practice guide, you should probably ensure that the minimum amount of equipment uh, is used in your sessions. Um, and equipment in sessions should be sanitised after each session and stored for use. It's common sense stuff, folks. It's not. It's it's it's, it's nothing crazy here. And then we'd also just remind you of that point again: that players should bring their own water bottles. So the advice for attending to injuries during training sessions and games. Uh, you uh, face mask obviously is a, a a big topic of discussion in society generally at the moment. Um, what we're saying, and, and indeed what the government have said to us, is that where physical distancing is not possible, uh, face masks should be worn. Uh, that's the government advice. So obviously out on our fields, social distancing and physical distancing is possible. Probably the only instance where it's not is if you're if you're treating a player who's gone down injured or if a child is, is having a bad day and crying or something like that. So no harm to have a face mask with you and, and to use it if you do have to go into close contact with someone. 
but we will give you more concrete advice on that in due course. And then the advice for a team if someone involved is diagnosed with COVID-19, uh, we're pending government advice on that, as I've mentioned to you earlier, um, but I would say to you there is a huge difference between a close contact and a casual contact. As I mentioned earlier, a close contact, it's likely to be someone that you met indoors, it's likely to be someone that you were face to face with for 15 minutes, and, and if it's a close contact of a person, uh, yes, you have to isolate for, for two weeks. However, if it's a casual contact, casual contact, you're advised by the government to monitor your health for the next 14 days. But again, uh, it's a big question, not just for the GEA, it's a question for every single sport in Ireland. What is a close contact uh, considered to be in terms of sport? And once the government give us that advice, trust me, we'll have it out to you as soon as we can. So the measures that exist for members who do not comply with the guidelines, I'm, I'd be at absolute pains again, folks, to point out that we're, we're doing this and you're going to be doing this on a best endeavours basis. The 700,000 people uh, who are members of our association are being asked to do this on uh, a best endeavours basis. Uh, it's not that much different from if you go down to the shop and you happen to come within a metre of someone else, you know, the alarms don't go off or anything like that. Uh, so I, I think you need to bear that in mind. Um, that, that this is guidelines and it's best endeavours basis that we're trying to do this. But having said that, I suppose issues of non-compliance should, should be mentioned to the club executive via the club secretary and preferably by the COVID supervisor for the for the relevant team. Um, and that's, that's pretty much what, what I'd say there on that. Okay, and again, this is the key question as to who has ultimate responsibility. So I suppose everybody has a role to play in ensuring that the protocols and that the guidance works. Um, and as I said earlier, ultimate safe return to contact sports is the per personal responsibility of each participant. And again, if members have a concern regarding personal higher risk, they should discuss the situation with their GP before deciding on whether to return to activity. I think it's very important, as Fergus stressed earlier, that people are not being forced to come back playing games, that there is the opt out if people feel under risk and they should uh, take on that um, responsibility seriously. That's ideal, thanks a million. So we've got through all that fairly fairly lively and fairness to everyone. Um, just a few next steps, I suppose, before we uh, before we wrap up. Um, and I might just actually try, further because you have a bit of extra time, I might try and get that uh, that video of the questionnaire up and running again. Um, so yeah, look, um, anyone who registered in advance uh, would have received a feedback form. Um, so we'd really appreciate if you took a minute to um, complete that. We, we might uh, post it on the learning portal anyway tomorrow to make it more widely accessible. Uh, just your feedback on, on the session uh, that we've had here and uh, more importantly, I suppose, uh, to identify one key uh, additional query that you may have that we will compile um, group into teams again and, and address in the coming days. Um, the advisory group will will take the lead on that. Um, so yeah, the e-learning module uh, will be available uh, later this week, I imagine in the next 48 hours, um, and that will be easily accessible on the learning.ga website. So we've we've just made the decision to uh, make the learning portal the key hub for all um, Gaelic Games related uh, COVID-19 education. So we encourage everyone to log on there and, and look at the facilities available there. Um, you know, I suppose we have additional resources available as well. There'll be um, signs available for clubs and posters, uh, infographics. Um, there's a guidebook being published and critically enough, I suppose there's an FAQ list being um, developed at the moment as well, which will, uh, you know, aim to address the, the overarching questions that, that everyone has um, and that they keep cropping up. Uh, as the lads alluded to earlier on, more webinars will certainly be rolled out for more specific areas um, games development uh, chief among them when it comes to on pitch activities. And then I suppose the last thing really uh, is that this webinar will of course be available again tomorrow uh, when we record and, and upload it onto the Geo Learning YouTube channel. So listen, thanks a million for tuning in. Uh, I think we had, uh, we maxed out about 4,000 attendees there. So my sincere thanks to uh, Fergal and to Shea. Um, and to the entire COVID advisory group and the COVID education team and everyone else is working behind the scenes and to yourselves as well. Um, it's a it's a tricky enough period coming up, but 
uh, we work together and we'll keep the communication lines open as best we can to ensure that we um, have a safe return to action for everyone. So as I said, this will be available tomorrow on the uh, GA Learning YouTube account and that'll be shared onto the Learning Portal as well, which will be the central hub for everything. So thank you very much for your, uh, your attention there this evening. Thank you. Thank you.